Balf. My name is George Spiro, and I, I direct the what we call the Centers for Neuroscience at West Virginia University, and we call ourselves the Centers because we've grown, and we have about 50 laboratories across the campus, and we have four four focus areas that are each centers in, in their own right, and they span the campus and go through the clinics and out into the community, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So. Um, Today, I, I don't have a title slide up here, but you're looking at a human brain. And I could title today's talk, Things You Can Legally Do to a Human Brain in the Clinic or, or in Research. And so, I've, so we'll take a little trip around. You can see the little pictures there. I have seven little vignettes, and I'll count them off as we go. And so what I've shown here is a human brain. And you know we have a left brain and a right brain. So you can kind of cut the brain in half. And so that's what's been done in this picture. And then now we're looking at the inside of the right side of the brain. And so we're going to go around to the different parts of the brain that do different things and learn a little bit about them and learn a little bit about what really is space age, what I'll call space age understanding and what's coming down the down the pike here in terms of brain research that is really different from anything we've thought we could do before and really transforming. And so we're going to begin, and we're going to go into this area right here. This is an area called the hypothalamus. And I'm going to take you back in time. You know what we're going to do is we'll... Uh, so we're going to go back to 1953. Does anyone use Prezi? <laughs> it is, uh, doesn't always work well. Let's hope we go. Okay. So 1953, this is McGill University up in Montreal. And the gentleman there on the left wearing his suit, there was a time where people actually wore suits and they went in the lab. We don't do that anymore. And so he's doing a very interesting experiment. You can see the rat in the little wooden box down there. And they were placing electrodes into different parts of the rat brain and stimulating those parts of the brain. And they were trying to find parts of the brain that made the rat happy or reward parts of the brain. So you know when you teach your dog to sit, you give them a little reward. And so they were thinking, maybe we can find the part of the brain and we can just stimulate that part of the brain and we don't have to give any food. And the animal will just bypass all that other stuff. And so they found this area in the lateral hypothalamus. And what they have here is a rat and there's a wire going to an electrode in that rat's brain. And again, we wouldn't hold the wire like that today. You, would get, you, know, you might get a little bit of a, a shock yourself. And so what they found was that the rat, if they put a lever in there and the rat accidentally came by the lever and pressed it, and then it would get a little shock through the electrode, that the rat might like that. And they found that in this location, the rat would notice it would hit the lever. This is a modern version of the experiment. And it would decide it liked that, and it would keep hitting the lever. And it would do that. It, the rat wouldn't eat. The rat wouldn't drink. The rat would run across an electrified floor in the cage to press the lever because it was getting such a, a, such a feeling of reward from that stimulation. And so that was really a transformative experiment in the history of modern neuroscience, that there was a part of the brain that you could focally activate and we would get that kind of sensation. And so what we know now over subsequent decades is that the, that part of the brain, and there's actually a network along the bottom of our brain of areas that are tied together that you can get the same kind of response. And there's a, what we call a neurotransmitter chemical. That's a chemical that transmits information from one neuron to the other through a synapse called dopamine. Now, you might have heard of dopamine. And another, and another neurotransmitter called serotonin that works in those pathways. So people who are taking antidepressants, often they're taking these serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and they affect the levels of these biochemicals and these neural circuits. And so they mediate rewards. And, we, and so what's developed is what we call the dopamine 
reward pathway. It also involves serotonin. And on the human brain, those are the areas that are colored in. Again, a lot of them are along the bottom of our brain. And so the thinking is that, okay, if someone is depressed, they don't have enough dopamine or serotonin, and that's the way we try to treat depression. If someone is addicted, be it to gambling, you know, be it to alcohol, whatever, they're somehow stimulating this part of the brain. And so if we could know a little more about this part of the brain, we might get a little handle on, on what's happening. Now there's another area that's also part of these part of this uh, region here that was mapped out using something called deep brain stimulation. And the thinking was maybe we can help people in the same way. That is, we can put an electrode into you know, that part of the brain and make somebody happy, right? And uh, so with mixed results, so this is the uh, technique. Who's familiar with deep brain stimulation? Okay, so this is, like, is space-age stuff. You wouldn't have thought 15 years ago that, that this is something that you would do to someone's brain. So this is what happens. Go into the neurosurgical suite. An electrode is placed deeply into the brain, about four inches deep into the brain. It has to be very carefully mapped. So this is the way it looks in the surgical suite with, with the careful placement of the probe and the patient is awake. The patient has to be awake during the surgery to tell you what they're feeling when you're doing the stimulation as you, and recording on the way down. And here's an x-ray showing the electrode deep in the brain. So there was a, uh, there have been anecdotal stories of stimulation in this part of the brain. So you can plunge the electrodes into different parts of the brain. And in a few anecdotal cases, and you can read here, this was very transformative for people suffering depression. In this case, this woman suffered 30 years of, of constant depression and was relieved by this kind of therapy. And so a double-blind study was started a couple years ago. It didn't quite pan out, don't lose hope, but uh, it was ended because it wasn't showing consist consistent effects in all people. But we'll come back to that. But there are miraculous sort of why are 100,000 people walking around with these deep brain stimulating electrodes uh, in their head, in their brain. And it turns out if we go into a different part of the brain, people with Parkinson's disease, then when the current is passed, these, these electrodes can move the way that they used to move. So people have Parkinson's tremors. And with deep brain stimulation, you can see the gentleman on the left, the current is off and just turn the current on and he's able to get up and walk around. And that's because there are circuits there that are kind of out of sync. They're a little epileptic. And the current through the deep brain stimula stimulating electrode will quiet them and then that motor control is able to uh, come along. And so this is where we are, and you think that, okay, uh, these electrodes are pretty small. That's, that's the size of these electrodes. But even great if we could design even smaller and finer electrodes, and the race is on to do that. And that's something that we have begun doing, merging our neuroscientists with our, elect with our engineers in, in the engineering school, our physicists, our, our chemists, to devise new styles of, of, uh, of these electrodes. And so, part two, I call the brain initiative. And many of you, this is how we're going to address some of these issues. Many of you might recall the Human Genome Project, 1990 to 2003, three and a half billion dollars spent by the federal government, the NIH. We sequenced one human genome in the end. It may not sound like a lot for three and a half billion dollars. But the technologies, the economic spin-off from that is estimated to be, to date, about $800 billion. And you know that the new technologies are out there, the companies are out there. Who's had their genome sequenced? For $1,000, you can send your swab off and get your entire genome back and with some analysis of what's good and bad in, in your genetics. But we know that genetics are not the entire story of who we are. It's, it's this thing right here, this three pound thing that consumes 20% of the energy that we take in. And uh, Dr. Marsh is in the back of the room, so that energy should not be sugar, right? 
<laughs> make, make sure you, you do it the healthy way. So we know that two people can have the same mutation. One may develop a cancer and one may not. What's different about all of us? We think what's different is that we're all wired a little bit differently. The connections in our brain are just a little bit different. And that might be why that, that treatment study for depression didn't quite work, because that part of the brain is a little different in people, and we need to know more about that. But we do have a brain initiative, and we're coming up on the third anniversary. It's a 12-year, $4.5 billion initiative, and the idea is to get into the brain, this most complex of part of our body, it is who we are, and get in there and try to match complexity with complexity in design and technology and, and big data, get in there and tackle the brain on, it, on, its own, you know, on its own turf and wrestle out some of these ideas and understanding of how the brain is actually working. And to give you an idea of, of, of what is being asked for in the brain initiative, this is a grand challenge that we just uh, announced uh, on the 19th of January. This is from DARPA. So some of the funding comes from the Department of Defense for the Brain Initiative, and you can see what they want. Now that deep brain stimulating electrode had two electrodes on it. And what they're saying is, okay, we want to have fully implantable devices in a human brain that can connect with up to one million neurons at one time. So now what we need are new designs. If you're going to have a million probes in the brain, they better be really tiny and, and, uh, and not stir up the brain tissue too much and not damage the brain. And so, for example, this is, uh, this is a recording. And you can see on the right where the jiggles start to get really big. That's the onset of an epileptic seizure. So you could imagine a one million electrode device implanted in someone's brain detecting when a certain part of the brain is beginning to go epileptic and then intervening by injecting current very carefully in the neural circuits or maybe even infusing a neurotransmitter or some sort of biochemical to fend that off. That would be one great way to use this sort of device. So part three, if we're gonna have a million electrodes at a time in our brain, we should be able to learn something about how our brain actually stores and retrieves information. And so this is Valeria Gritsenko at our university and Sergei Yakovenko. Sergei is Ukrainian. He, uh, he returns to the U Ukraine every year and teaches a course and you know, puts on his bulletproof vest and, and goes into the Ukraine and, and comes out with a couple of graduate very smart graduate students and brings them back to WVU every year. This is Costa Sierras. He had a, he's got a lab party going on at his home there. Uh, he's in electrical engineering. And uh, together, they are designing these new generations of what we call flexible electrodes, so flexible bioelectronics. So here's an example of one that's, that's been placed on the skin. And you can distort the skin, and the electrodes maintain their contact. Well, imagine that's the kind of thing that we need if we're going to go into the brain. So now the idea is to apply these flexible surfaces onto the surface of the brain, but then think about having flexible devices that you might pin cushion into the brain. So instead of using this kind of existing today's technology where it's kind of like a bed of nails, you know? You would go in and as the brain moves around and pulsates, obviously you're gonna cause some local damage. But imagine a device that you could implant into the brain and maybe whatever gave it the stiffness might be biodegradable and dissolve and you would have flexible electrodes floating inside the brain. So these are the, this is a kind of initiative that we're ramping up now to get going at WVU. And that's the other theme of my talk today is that we're not gonna make any progress in this new era of brain understanding and brain research unless we marry neuroscience with engineering, physics, chemistry, math. That's the only way to go forward. And the brain initiative is really, it's advancing neurotechnology. So that's the acronym, Innovative Neurotechnology, the AIN in brain. And a lot of the money that's even the NIH is putting out there is really to go to engineering these kinds of new solutions. So what can we do with that? 
let's back up here. This little area of the brain here, it's called the medial temporal lobe. So we talk about brain complexity. Well, we have about 86 billion neurons in the human brain. How can we remember that? Well, if a, if a neuron cost a dollar, then Bill Gates could just about buy one human brain. He's got enough dollars to buy one human brain. And so they're really, this is a group, I, I show this to, uh, I have a, teach a one hour honors class and I showed them this picture and nobody knew it. <laughs> Who are they? <laughs> so there are two, two general competing theories about how the brain stores information. Does all this complex information get collected and, and just a few cells store that information? That's called the grandmother cell theory. That is, there's a cell in your brain that represents your grandmother. And if you lose that cell or a few of those cells that are doing that job, you lose your memory of everything about your grandmother. Or is information distributed across you know, millions of those 86 billion neurons at one time, and you can suffer a lot of loss of neurons and still remember your grandmother. So this is my favorite granny. <laughs> the only granny I know that you know, carries a shotgun around. And, uh... and so this is an interesting experiment. And this is, uh, again, not a lot of centers do this work. And we are ramping up to do this kind of work. So this was uh, some neuroscientists uh, working with a neurosurgeon at UCLA did this experiment about 10 years ago. And they were recording in that area with simple electrodes, a single probe electrode, recording from single neurons. And the blue things are little electrical blips of the neuron. Bip, bip, bip. So when the neuron is liking something, it's bip, 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 blipping away. And they were showing this is an area that we know is is, uh, is an area where faces get represented in the brain. And so they were showing pictures of you know, everybody, cartoon faces, and they held up a picture of Jennifer Aniston. And of course, the, and the, the patient is awake, and the, uh, then ba 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 bum And so they showed another picture of Jennifer Aniston, and then they showed Jen smiling. And they showed young Jen, different outfits, and the neuron liked all of those. They even showed a picture of Jen with Brad Pitt, and the neuron liked that too. It, rec it recognized Jennifer Aniston. When they held up Haley Berry, nothing. And when they showed these other pictures, really not much. Someone who looks a lot like number 38 looks a lot like Jen, nothing. And then they found another neuron that actually was a Halle Berry neuron. And so the idea here is that, well, maybe the brain does represent information more in this grandmother cell kind of, you know, kind of a mode. And we won't really know until we can get that million electrode array in and record from a lot of neurons at the same time and figure out a little better what's going on. Now, we don't always want to record with electrodes sticking in the brain. It's nice to do it non-invasively. Many people have had you know, maybe you've had your brain in an MR scanner or a PET scanner. So those are relatively, PET is relatively non-invasive. And I just want to highlight, so last year many of you were here and you listened to Julie Brzezinski Lewis from the Neuroscience Center. When the Brain Initiative was announced and the NIH had their first round of funding, uh, 37 institutions received funding. And you can see, this is the map from the NIH website, and you can see WVU. So we, even though we're small, we're a lot smaller than most places, we have some really good things going in neuroscience. And so the pet helmet is one of those, and, the, and Julie, I think, brought her. It's a ring of detectors, pet being positron emission tomography. It's a way to, to do brain scanning. And the idea being that you can learn a lot more about the brain when people can actually walk around and carry the detector when you're lying on your back inside of a scanner, right? Especially an MR scanner that's like bomb, 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 pounding in your ear. So this is what we're doing since you heard from Julie last year, is uh, setting things up 
So you could have a virtual reality kind of a setting. So for example, if you wanted to understand what made someone anxious in a social setting, you could have them sitting in a chair and in virtual reality, creating the sorts of situ situations that might make them anxious. And so we've been making progress there. And we have this new design of a pet helmet that, again, is based on new technologies, new detector technologies. We can make them smaller, and they're more sensitive. And instead of having a ring, we, we're designing a cap. And so we have another grant in, another Brain Initiative grant in, and we're hoping that we'll be successful with that so we can keep carrying that one forward. And this is another thing you can do with pets. So this is dopamine binding in the brain. And you can see along the bottom our normal brains. So you can see there are a lot of dopamine receptors. And you can see what happens to those dopamine receptors after a lot of alcohol consumption or in obesity or, or uh, after uh, drug consumption. The numbers of those receptors actually go down. So, th so the addict has to keep driving and getting more and more and more to drive an ever smaller system to get that sort of reward that we were talking about earlier. OK, so let's, uh, we're on to number four here. So uh, how does the brain store stimulation part two, store information part two? And I want to tell you about a cool technology that's just in the lab, but it's going to end up in the human brain at some point. And using some very clever molecular genetics, we can introduce a protein into nerve cells and into selected nerve cells so that when you shine light on those nerve cells, you can drive activity in the cell. So that protein will actually drive the cell to be electrically active. And so it, depending where you put that protein, then you shine light on the brain, and you'll activate different circuits. And well, what can happen? So here's an example of an animal just sort of walking around. This is a mouse. And the light went on, and the mouse started to walk. So you talk about mind control. So this was very cleverly putting this protein into these motor decision circuits and turning on the light and then causing the mouse to run around. So this is the level of understanding that we're beginning to achieve about how brain circuits are, are working and then, um, and then coming up with ways that we might affect those and, and, and drive those circuits. So what do we need to do that? A typical fiber optic, if you look at a fiber optic cable, it's, it's made of lots of little fiber optic tube guides, light guides, but they're still kind of big to be plunging into a human brain. These are the latest generation of, of light guides, and you can see how small they are. That's a human hair, and so this is a light guide. And so the next step then is working with engineers and physicists and designing this next generation of penetrable light-guided probes, so instead of passing current, you're introducing light. Well, again, just as with recording, you can record with PET or MRI non-invasively. We can also stimulate the brain non-invasively, and this is something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So a device is hovered over a given part of the brain, a magnetic field is generated, it passes through the skull, and it induces electrical activity within a couple centimeters of the bone inside of, of the person's brain. And so this is very useful for mapping someone's individual <laughs> wiring organization prior to a surgery, for example. Uh, it's been used in treatments for, uh, for uh, depression also, and, uh, and also to relieve pain. And there's also a uh, take it home version of this and so uh, this person is, is uh, using the stimulator. It fits on the back of the head. And so in the case of chronic migraine, some people uh, experience some relief from having this sort of thing. Now, we being who we are, there are people who do this at home. And, and I'll say, don't do this at home, <laughs> OK? For $20, you can buy a little, a little battery. And you can be this guy. And just turning it on and passing a little bit of current. There are people who claim that their concentration improves. So there's, it's incredible what people are, are claiming here. But you can't, you know, you could make one of these and, and test it out. And hopefully not cause long lasting problems for your brain. Okay. <laughs> okay, number five. 
the brain-machine interface. Okay, we all remember this scene, right? This is Luke Skywalker's bionic arm. Well, that scene is almost reality. So here's a gentleman. This is from the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins. You can see he's a double amputee. The nerve stumps remain in his chest, and they're hooked up to this bionic arm. And so they're tapping into his thoughts. He's thinking, I'm going to move my wrist this way. I'm going to open my hand. And he's actually able to do it. So those signals are decoded out of the nerve stump and into the bionic arm. Now that project is also DARPA funded. University of Pittsburgh has a big part of it. And Sergei Yakovenko has a big subcontract at WVU to work on the sensory part of the arm. So you know that you know, if you close your eyes and try to walk across the floor, you're not going to do very well. You like to have that sensory feedback to do things better. And having sensory capability in the robotic arm makes it much more natural and much more like Luke Skywalker's arm. OK, part six, neuroethics. This is a new field, new-ish field. But it has new meaning in the context of everything I've been telling you. So for example, if we can plunge multiple million electrode arrays into a brain, we're going to look a lot, learn a lot about the brain. And you could imagine that we might be able to engineer human-like intelligence and just put it into a computer. And in fact, as part of the brain initiative, this is, uh, this is Dave trying to disable HAL in 2001, the space odyssey. HAL, the computer, was getting a little out of control and taking over things from the humans. So this is another grand challenge. And if you're into conspiracy theories, this is one that you might want to get a little concerned about. And this is reality. So you see along the bottom. So, so the, um, the grand challenge, and, and again, this comes out of the Department of Defense. This is IARPA. DARPA is Defense Advanced. IARPA is Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Administration. And they're challenging the research institutions in the United States to create a new type of computer that can proactively interpret and learn from data, solve unfamiliar problems using what it has learned, and operate with the energy efficiency of the human brain. They basically want a human brain, you know, working on the same amount of energy as a human brain, doing what a human brain does. And in fact, I don't know if uh, many of you read this, but in the last year, a United Nations panel, it's a non-binding resolution, recommended that governments, mostly the United States, not put the intelligence autonomous, autonomously on board of a drone to make a decision to, to uh, kill a human being. That that decision ultimately has to rest with another human being. So, the idea is that people are worried enough about this technology because we are approaching the day, it won't look like this, where people will be heavily instrumented and we will be reading out a lot of information from brains. Now, it's one thing if that's used on board to maybe prevent that epileptic seizure. It's another thing if Big Brother has access to that information and knows something about what's going on in our heads. And so I want to return, this is part seven of seven here, I'm going to return at the end to this part of the brain here in, in the, uh, we're in this reward circuitry. And Dr. Marsh mentioned the addiction problem. What are we doing in the, in the neuroscience uh, uh, research realm at WVU? We have four research areas. One is addiction, another in stroke, another in sensory neuroscience, and another in cognitive neuroscience. And so our addiction group, uh, this is the problem. So these are, these are deaths by opioid overdose per capita. You can see more in the southern part of the state, but not good numbers anywhere. This is the problem as it emerged in the 1990s. These are millions, uh, thousands of new users, thousands of thousands, so millions of new users without a prescription of, of opioids. So this is the man-made problem of opioid addiction. This is uh, Raleigh Sullivan. Dr. Marsh mentioned Raleigh on the right. And he's developed this COAT clinic, the Comprehensive Opioid 
comprehensive opioid addiction, addiction <coughs> treatment clinic. And a lot of it centers around this molecule called bup buprenorphine that binds to the, these opioid receptors. It's like a neurotransmitter like dopamine and serotonin, but it, but it then prevents the high that people get, the pleasure that people get when they take uh, their drugs. But it's really, it's not at the scale that it needs to be, and this is the big problem. So we have about 500 people actively in the clinic, about 500 wanting to come in, but we don't have the capacity, and Dr. Marsh just, uh, just uh, authorized the hiring of more people. Uh, but still, we need to do more. And so uh, what Raleigh has been doing is looking for ways to exp expand the clinic through the state. From a research perspective, we're studying the clinic now to understand better what works and what doesn't work and what we can introduce. And what do we do then from a neuroscience perspective? Well, I think that the key and the reason that that original deep brain stimulation for depression didn't work is that we don't know enough about the circuitry in this part of the brain and how it differs person to person. And so uh, this is one of our initiatives. We're going to go forward and bring in the people that we need to to make a full frontal assault on this part of the brain and dissect it into its pieces so that we can go in with these electrodes. These are called electroceuticals, by the way. So instead of taking a drug, you would have an electrical therapy. But you can merge it with a pharmaceutical therapy. And we can devise new strategies, not only for the Treatment end, as Dr. Marsh said, that's the back end. That's the tough, that's tough. When someone's an addict, it's a lifelong recovery. The idea is to understand what, how does someone become an addict? And I think by understanding these circuits and being able to track them when people are young and identify those predilections toward, toward becoming addicts, then, then we'll be in a much better place. To distill down, the way that uh, sort of a theoretical ap approach to, to, uh, to I guess, uh, this emotional feeling. You know, it's, the rat is pressing the bar at the beginning to get some pleasure, some kind of pleasure. What we're really looking for is happiness, which you can think of as pleasure with a purpose. And understanding those circuits that may not only be tied into that part of the brain is a way that we're going to understand what a, a very healthy brain looks like. And then, since Dr. Marsh is in the room, I'll do actually part eight. Um, there, is a, there is a part of the brain, a couple parts of the brain, that make new nerve cells. So there are these things called neural stem cells. You've heard of stem cells. A stem cell is a cell that can become any kind of cell. So these neural stem cells, they're not neurons, but they can turn into neurons or they can in, turn into glial cells. In pink here, we're showing new neurons that were born in an adult mouse in an area of the brain called the hippocampus. That's part of the reward circuitry, very important for forming new memories. And there was a study that came out in rats a couple of weeks ago. I thought I would share it with you. So this group had rats sitting around. They had rats, I mean, they forced them to sit. They had rats that were just kind of walking around their cage. They had rats that were on the running wheel doing aerobic exercise for long periods of time. They had rats that were doing high intensity training where they would run fast and then stop and run fast, kind of like playing a basketball game. And then they had rats, rats weightlifting. They were climbing ladders with weights tied to them and they actually bulked up. And then they looked at the stem cells and you can see that these are pretty similar. Here are the sitting around rats. They didn't have these brown objects are the new cells. But over here, it's the aerobic exercise. More so than the other, the other kinds of exercise didn't make much difference. It was that aerobic exercise that generated many, many more neural stem cells in that hippocampus part of the brain than any other kind of, kind of activity. Exercise is great for your brain, and I'm just going to leave you with that advice, is to get out there and walk around, right? Yeah. And with that, we'll go back and look at the brain, and I'm happy to entertain any questions or comments, and I think we came in pretty well on time. So. We covered a lot of territory. <laughs>
<laughs> From Ham. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Sudoku puzzles don't do it. <laughs> they don't do it. And the, uh, the idea is to engage your brain globally. And what engages your brain globally? When you travel, you travel to a new place, every part of your brain is active. It's very stimulating for the brain. Learning a new language at age 75, that's, it's very challenging. You know, it's, it's uh, the use it or lose it sort of thing. I mean, it, there are great therapies now in stroke, for example, that are called forced use therapies. So people with a stroke tend to use the limb that, that's working and the other limb they kind of let go. But if a good limb is tied down, even if you're right-handed and you're forced to use the left hand, it's incredible the plasticity that can be induced. And people then can pick up a glass and drink smoothly. As, as they hadn't been able to even months after the stroke, letting that, that limb just sort of not develop properly. So it's this kind of global activation that engages all circuits. Well, music, uh, well, there, there are a lot of studies correlating music with IQ, right, when you do that developmentally. Um, if you're not a musician and you decide to become one later in life, I would say I, I'm not aware of you know, good science behind it, but it's that kind of transforming sort of activity. A lot of people pick up creative activities, painting, and all their lives they never considered themselves to be a very creative person. Those are great sorts of activities that, that really force you to stretch and get out of yourself, and they're so rewarding too. I mean, I'm not a painter, but it's uh, <laughs> people who paint tell me that they, it's rewarding when they paint. So I remember, uh, Churchill took up painting later on. Winston Churchill. He did. I wasn't aware of that. Well, he was very depressed after he was voted out of office, and so that might have been very uh, therapeutic for him. Huh? Probably, yeah, probably. Uh, acupuncture in terms of um, relieving pain, the, probably there's something to it. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, a state of well-being, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. There are people who swear by it in terms of you know, having some sort of scientific study of, of acupuncture and its effects on well-being. I'm not aware of any great, you know, great data about that. George, yeah. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yeah. Alcohol, but not enough that depletes your dopamine receptors. So, uh, you know, everything in moderation. Yeah, there's so in the news uh, lately, it's, uh, what was it, uh, turmeric? Uh, but there seems not to be, uh, you know, a lot behind that. Uh, Jim, other, other than, than uh, we, we do know that I mean, you saw the, the slide, obesity and, and its effects on, on, on brain systems. Um, you know, good nutrition is certainly good for the brain. Uh, beyond that, you know, eat your broccoli, although George Bush didn't eat broccoli and he, he seemed to have done pretty well. Um, I don't have a good answer for you there, but you know we all know the good rules of good nutrition. Yeah, we do a lot of bad sleeping, don't we? Yeah. And um, yeah, so this is you know this is the thing, and you you see it even uh, in in presidential campaigns that uh, you have to think that a lot of the stupid things that people do and say. Uh, come from the fact that they're not sleeping <laughs> properly. So, so, 
and there's, you know, there's a lot of interesting data. How, mu how much sleep is the right amount? And, um, you know, when you're, when you're younger, when you're in your 20s, then maybe eight to nine hours as we get older, it seems that on average uh, people need less. What do you do with the person who sleeps three or four hours a night and claims they're fine and they're very productive? I guess you say, go for it. Uh, don't sleep longer. But certainly, yeah, sleep. People who work late shifts, uh, mothers uh, who, who don't sleep well, their EEGs get completely goofed up. And um, good sleep is very, very important. One more question right over here. Well, I should quit then. Are you getting uh, Are you getting any benefit? The program says I am. Uh, yeah, lumosity. Uh, there's no good data behind lumosity. People have studied lumosity, and it doesn't, doesn't really do much. You might want to buy those batteries and a couple electrodes. On. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.